Hello and welcome to Money, Money, Money. I'm Sumera Abdi. 2016 has started on a tumultuous note for the market. So is this the time to worry and pull out all your money or is this the time to actually keep the faith and plow on? Preparing the ground for the benefits that are to accrue later. After all, as they say, the long-term trend is always up. From 1964, when UTI was the only AMC in India, to the year 2000, when the industry size stood at 79,000 crores, to 2016, when the mutual fund industry has grown to 12.7 lakh crores, which is a compounded growth of about uh, over 16%. So stay invested, that's the mantra. But how do you identify the mutual funds that will suit your asset allocation, first by category, then perhaps by fund house? Feroz Aziz of Anandrati Private Wealth Management joins in with an insight into the peculiarities of every fund that's worth talking about. Feroz, thanks very much for joining in. But, you know, my first question to you is, every advisor who comes on the show says, stay invested for the long term, right? But has the mutual fund industry actually done justice to the long term investor? Yes, that's a very valid question. When you keep hearing all advisors telling you, stay invested for the long term, and then you see so many market cycles, now, that's very difficult to live through the short term. That's when long term can actually arrive, right? Otherwise, if you can't live through the volatility, yeah. then long term is academic. So now if you actually uh, look at how the industry, when there was privatization in the sector uh, in 93, 94, there were several schemes launched. And in 95, there were about 10, 12 private sector mm. mutual funds. If, if one invested his 100 rupees in Nifty, as against in mutual fund, in the last 20 years, it is 100 rupees has become 900 rupees. That is what is the market's mm. growth. Or at the same time, if you would have chosen all the 10 funds which were available back then and invested 10 rupees in each, the money, 100 rupee, rather than becoming 900 in Nifty, in the industry, all good, bad, ugly schemes, 100 has become 2700. Hmm. So, so an alpha or an extra return vis-a-vis -vis the nifty of close to about 1800 rupees on a base of 100. Hmm. That's a reasonable value add as an industry which has been provided in the long run, long run here taken as 20 years. Okay, but what about the two extremes then? I mean, uh, I know in the long term there is no unlucky investor. But what about like the luckiest investor or the unluckiest investor? What would be uh, uh, the returns that they could have made over this period? A very, very interesting question. See, what happens is, this is like mechanically taking 95 and then do comparing it with 2015. Mm. Where it was not, there were so many trading days where people could have invested. Mm. Now, if you actually took four first private sector funds and if you checked if 10 years was the invested, it's my investment time frame. Every day if one invested for 10 years, different people, hmm. the luckiest guy, for example, in the fund, Franklin Blue Chip Fund, made 33% compounded as against the most unluckiest 10-year investor, hmm. made 14% return compounded. So, even if you were the unluckiest 10-year investor, in a Franklin Blue Chip Fund, for example, you've made 14% compounded growth, right, which is twice more than debt currently. All you need to wish and pray is 10 years. The investing time frame is dependent on you. You just have to wish and pray that you're not the unluckiest, uh, more unlucky than the unluckiest, and then 14% compounded growth. Yeah, and even the unluckiest isn't too bad, actually. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's not even so much as fund selection as the fact that you've got to remain invested once you're in. Right. Okay, but, uh, you know, these kind of returns, yeah. therefore, should ideally be able to be replicated over the next 10, 20 years as well, right? So what are the top categories then? I mean, should categories even matter over the next 10, 20 years? Or is it just enough to say that, okay, invest today and then just stay invested? Core portfolio should comprise of only three categories. Mm -hmm. And I emphasize only three categories. Large cap funds, mid cap funds and opportunistic funds, opportunity mm -hmm. funds as they call them. If you look at the average returns of these three categories over 10 year, three year, five year time frames, you would see that in the large cap category, the average of all the large cap funds, which are 100 odd funds put together for the last 10 years is 14 percent. But the top 25 percent of these 100 schemes have generated more than 14, of course, because they're the top 25 percent mm. schemes, and that is about 18 and a half. So there's a difference of 4 percent. So first point which I'm trying to make is don't get digressed with all these interesting options so, like Warren Buffett said, if you're, if you're enjoying investing, mm. most likely you're not making money. 
in the mid cap category average is 26 for 10 years but the top quartile is 33 mm. and in the opportunities um, opportunity funds which can invest in any size of companies the average is about 18 and the top 25% uh, of the schemes is about close to 23 24 wow. so the averages and the top have a difference of four to five percent in each category you know that's true actually because even if you were to ask any celebrity today about their work and you think that it's all glamour and they'll tell you that actually it's just all hard work so that's what it is stock picking or even mutual funds is just down to hard boring work and that's Absolutely. All, really all it takes but tell me something Firoz over the years you know you've been coming on this show you've recommended some really good performing funds right now if I I want a large chunk of my portfolio to be in that top quartile or the top 25%. How do I actually ensure that? Very importantly, there are two methods of selecting. For example, how do we do it? Hmm. Okay, one, one method which is just to attach yourself to a good research guy who can actually choose the schemes for you. Hmm. Right? If you can afford a uh, financial planner, it will help. Now, how does Anand Rati choose the schemes, for example? There are two methods. One, which is an objective method, which is more hmm. statistical in nature, okay. is to find seven parameters which actually have a very strong correlation to future performance. See, one is choosing on the basis of past performance. Mm. Statistically, there are subjects available in statistics which help you understand future projections. Like a company projects its future. Mm. Not projects, of course, there could be a dispersion from the projections. But there are seven, eight statistical variables which have a strong degree of impact on future performance. So Anand Rathi uses a combination of these mm. seven. The other thing, which is the more subjective thing, is a fund manager's job is to take decisions. So I call them right to wrong ratios. Mm -hmm. Okay, If his job is to take decisions, if you just understood his last hundred decisions and found out how many were right, how many were wrong, mm -hmm. it gives you a very good sense whether the fund manager is taking more right decisions or wrong. So any fund manager who takes 80 right decisions out of the hundred, then you latch on to that fund manager and say mm -hmm. that I'm going to stay with him. Or then you can rely on money control, for example, mm -hmm. who does a lot of such work and gives you the output yeah. in the form of star ratings so make sure that you choose the schemes right that's when you will be in the top 25 percent of the schemes and like you rightly pointed out it's very important over the years that your schemes largely fall in the top 25 percent mm -hmm. which is called the top quartile in the nomenclature which okay, we see so you've listed out our two ways one is to go the direct route one is to go through a broker right Correct. but if I were to go direct I would see a, a better return yes. right or perhaps lower charges whatever what is the case for an investor to actually go with a broker? Why should I take a broker? The first is the understanding the cost implication of these two options which the investor has. Mm -hmm. The cost differential is between 0.5 to 0.7 percent per annum. See, in the equity category, what happens is the best and the worst funds have a very large dispersion. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you go wrong in a scheme, you might lose 5-10%. But the cost of choosing a broker is as little as 0.5 to 0.7%. So people generally, large investors for example, choose on the debt side direct, on the equity side okay. they choose a broker. Because on the debt side if you went wrong, the implication of going wrong is just a 1.5-2%. Mm. So you would want to save cost there. But if going wrong on equity can wash away the cost of the next 20 years in one year. So you're better off paying the cost and saying that he will be able to recover the cost. So so this is a diff disparate, uh, different strategy on two sides of the assets. Debt, mm -hmm. you can go still direct, but equity, never choose to actually be penny wise and pound foolish mm -hmm. and say I'll save 0.5. But if you go wrong one year, you've lost 10%, which is next 20 years cost is gone in a year. Mm -hmm. And if you get one bad year in 20 years, you've washed away all the benefit of the cost advantage. Yeah, that's true. Actually, that's some interesting math over there. And I hate to cut short this conversation, but we've got to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to continue talking with Feroz and we're going to tell you all about the fine print of the mutual funds including the various charges, when does it make sense to pay the exit load and a whole lot more. Stay tuned, we'll be back in just a bit.